Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Patty Kay is training us on growing our sales with seven counterintuitive marketing insights. Patty, let's start with a couple of get to know you questions. Firstly, what kind of client work gives you most joy? Well, I'd have to say my favorite, uh, my favorite work with clients is helping them organize their messaging and their thoughts. Um, if, if I have a superpower, it's being able to take uh, mountains of information and kind of uh, rambling thoughts and ideas and, uh, um, it, you know, when people struggle to describe what it is that they do and how they do it and they, they're kind of all over the place and confused um, and really muddled with it, I, I can take that all in, organize it and make sense of it. Um, and that just, it, it just brings me such joy uh, to be able to do that. Oh, that's wonderful. So with that uh, superpower, what are your absolutely ideal, gorgeous, drop-dead clients? Um, my, my best clients are uh, coaches or consultants, experts of some sort um, that are doing something positive in the world and that they have a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise and value that they bring to their audience. Um, or to, or to their clients, like they're, they're doing something good and useful and positive and progressive. Um, and they're struggling to come up with that message. And uh, those are my people. Beautiful, beautiful, lovely. Uh, audience, uh, if you have questions, please type them into the chat. And uh, at intervals during Patty's presentation, I will pose your questions to Patty. Uh, uh, your, uh, by the end of the evening, all your questions will have received answers. The video recording of Patty's training session will be made public a little bit later this evening, and uh, you'll be provided with a link. Patty, are you ready to rock the stage? Oh, you betcha. Then take it away. The stage belongs to you. All right. Get my, uh, get my slides working here. All right, so tonight's presentation is all about counterintuitive insights um, to help you grow your business. And what do I mean by counterintuitive? <laughs> Dictionary definition says that that is contrary to intuition or common sense expectation, but often nevertheless true. So one of the one of the things I want to do with this presentation is to invite you to question everything, including me and what I have to say. But I, one, of the, one of the things that we're faced with in this world is we have information overload. We get a ton of incoming advice and we often just listen to the advice without really questioning whether that advice holds true for us for our situation, for our context, for our specific business, for the specific clients that we work with, whether it works with our personality. And a lot of times this information comes at us saying, um, you know, everyone says this and it, this, there's only one way to do it. And, you know, you're making these mistakes. Um, and it's not necessarily good advice for us. So with this idea of talking about counterintuitive um, insights, a lot of this is, is going to come back to this idea of questioning. Um, is, this, is this true for me? Is this true for my business? Or is this just something that's kind of bandied about and is, uh, is uh, very popular advice? So question everything. Um, and one of the questions that you might want to ask that you probably should ask me um, is who is this presentation for? Who am I talking to? Where, you know, what, what is what is this about? It, just to get a sense of whether or not this is going to be a fit for you. So I put this presentation together. Um, for those of you who might be feeling a little bit frustrated, confused, or overwhelmed uh, by marketing and marketing advice, a lot of my clients come to me and they're like, Patty, expert A says to do this. And expert B says, do exactly the opposite. Um, this is confusing and it is frustrating. Uh, this came up a, a couple of times um, 
earlier on when people were introducing themselves and talking about marketing challenges is technology. Uh, a lot of people are like funnels, technical stuff. I don't know what kind of technology to use. I can't get the, the um, technology uh, working together. Um, I've got technical issues um, with setting stuff up and there's a lot of frustration attached to that. Uh, and then, you know, for my people, <laughs> um, heart-centered kind of purpose-driven kinds of entrepreneurs, some of the advice that we get is, um, you know, what someone commented, I want to do this without being too salesy. Some of it's kind of salesy, kind of pushy, in some cases a little bit manipulative. Um, my clients are often looking for a different way. So this is kind of the angle that I'm coming at um, with this presentation is, you know, ethical honest kind of approach to marketing. And my clients, um, as I mentioned earlier, are coaches and consultants and experts. They are typically self-employed. They run relationship-based businesses, which means that they work with their clients one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. So if you look at these two things together, self-employed um, in relationship-based business, um, there's a very limited amount of time and resources available. They don't have a staff, they don't necessarily have a lot of money, and a lot of their time needs to be spent actually working with their clients, doing their actual work. So they don't have uh, tons and tons and tons of time to spend on sales and marketing. So everything that I say kind of comes through this filter. This is this is my experience. This is the people that I work with. This is me. <laughs> this is what my business looks like. So I'm not um, here professing that I know what to do with a big brand or a big organization or another type of business. Um, that being said, I know that Roger uh, attracts an audience outside of just the people that I work with. And I've put this together with kind of um, a broader picture of uh, um, who might be here. And I'm thinking that there's going to be some takeaways for you, regardless of what kind of business that you're in. And in fact, just because you might have a staff and some resources and lots of money and lots of time doesn't necessarily mean um, that you want to blow it all. So you might be able to pick up a couple of things from uh, my presentation tonight. Uh, there's the chat. Um, please, if you have a question, if you have a comment, I would love to hear it. Roger's going to stop uh, once in a while and read out what you have to say to me. But uh, if you have a question, I am happy uh, to answer them. Um, and here we go. So this is a this is a quote. I really like this this quote. Is um, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. Um, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Possibly from Mark Twain, but this gets to kind of the heart of looking at things counterintuitively is to really question what you think you already know. Um, and often that's the stuff that, that we never pay attention to. It's just like we know. We know what to do. It makes sense. We've heard it often enough. Um, and uh, we don't question these things that we don't know. And often when I talk to my clients, it's those sorts of things that are where the real problem is. So I kind of invite you to, to look at that uh, a bit today. Because here's something that is true is that we all lack perspective. Uh, so you may have heard some of these sayings before. Uh, you know, sometimes you're kind of lost amongst the trees and you can't see the whole forest. Or as a business coach friend of mine likes to say, uh, you can't see the whole picture when you're trapped inside the frame. Um, and my personal favorite um, is that you can't read the label on your own jar. We are, you know, we are locked into our own selves and our own view of reality from the inside. And your perspective of your business is very different from the people out there. I often say that, you know, we are the star of our own personal movie. And even the clients that we work with, we're only kind of like a 
you know, a bit a bit player in their movie. We're, we're just this small piece of their world. And, and we forget, it's so easy to forget that people don't know what we know. And when it comes to marketing, we're often not able to describe what we do um, in a way that our ideal clients can understand it because we don't have that perspective of what it, what it means to look at our business um, without that knowledge. So I'm hoping that I can provide a little bit of perspective uh, today. So uh, as uh, Wayne Dyer says, in terms of getting this perspective, is that when you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at change. So uh, first, uh, first little bit of counterintuitive insight um, is that there's one really common marketing kind of instinct that sometimes leads us astray. And this came up a bit uh, during the introductions and also it also came up in our little group discussion that we had about having to kiss a lot of frogs in order to, uh, to find the right ones. And that's this idea of we want to reach and talk to as many people as possible. And uh, this often sounds like, how do I meet all of the people? How do I uh, get in front of bigger and bigger audiences? How do I somehow use technology in order to put me in front of thousands of people? How do I grow a list to thousands and thousands? How do I more, 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 more people, more connections? Um, and even questions like, do I connect with all of the people who want to connect with me on LinkedIn? Or am I a little bit more discerning about it? Um, but intuitively, we think, oh, the more people that know about me and about what I do, the better. Uh, and then the question from here is kind of like, is that actually true? Um, we have limits to the numbers of people that we can actually have a relationship with and make a really good connection with. Um, so if we look at us as kind of this beginning bubble, there here's you. And in terms of the relationships that you have, and let's just look at your business uh, for these relationships, is that you have an inner circle. Um, you may have heard Jim Rohn's quote about you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. These are kind of your inner circle. Uh, these are the people that you know well and they know you really well. And they're a big influence on you. You're a big influence on them. Then that grows out. You got 50 people that you may consider, uh, you may consider friends. If you're an introvert, that number might be a little bit lower. Um, 150 people. This is Dunbar's number. And this is the kind of the theoretical maximum number of relationships that we can have where we truly understand how those people are related to each other and how they're related to us. And beyond that, um, relationships get looser. They're not, they're not close. 150, you know, 150 is, is a number of people that you can feel like you know. That grows out, you know, 500, maybe 500 people you might consider to be acquaintances. Um, a thousand people. This is, if you've ever read Kevin Kelly's article on a thousand raving fans, fabulous article where he says that in order for, he wrote this uh, for entertainers, for musicians, um, that in order to have a thriving business selling their music, all they needed was a thousand raving fans. The people that would attend the concerts and buy all of the, um, the, <laughs> I think the article's dated. I think he talks about like CDs and stuff like that. Uh, but they buy all of the stuff. It's a thousand raving fans. They might have some ordinary fans beyond that, but a thousand raving fans to, to, if you could have that, you could have a successful business that would support um, the members in the band. Beyond that, 1500 is about our limit uh, for connecting names and faces. This is kind, you know, beyond this, I mean, we can use social media, we can use uh, tools to create a list um, much larger than that, but you're not going to have a relation, like you're not really going to have a two way relationship with people beyond that. Um, so when you look, when you look at this, so when you think about, um, first of all, 
every person that you are connected with is connected to lots of people as well. When um, I did a workshop of, um, a couple of months ago, uh, I think we had 12 people in the room and we asked people to total up. It's like, okay, how many connections do you have? How many people are you connected to on LinkedIn? How many people do you have on an email list? How many do you follow on social media? It's kind of like, let's do an inventory. How many people are you attached? Are you attached to in some way? And we topped 100,000 people between um, the group. And we're not talking about, um, like we're talking about, you know, my people, independent, self-employed coaches and consultants together. We had numbers that said that we, we in common knew 100,000 people. Uh, but what we potentially had a close relationship with was the people in the room, because we 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 um, we know each other. We know the names. We can we can ha we can talk uh, to each other. So when you think about getting referrals, about um, people becoming clients, are they coming from this big green circle on the outside and far beyond that, or are they actually coming from the ones that are closer to the center? Uh, most business, if you heard the 80-20 rule, most businesses will get 80% of their referrals from 20% of the people that they um, are in touch with. 80% of their business from 20% of their clients. The people who are most likely uh, to refer you and help you out are the ones that are going to be closer to you and actually know you. And I think sometimes we make these connections believing that just because we're connected that somehow somebody might refer us because we're loosely connected on LinkedIn, but they have no idea who we are and we have no idea who they are. And our, the chances of anything meaningful coming out of that are pretty slim. Uh, so when you think about, you know, limited amount of time for building relationships, it can really pay to be really strategic about who are those people that you want to invest some of that time uh, building relationships with who can reach people who can buy from you um, who would be like really really good referral partners who can connect you with people that would actually uh, be good clients and to focus on those folks rather than trying to um, spend all of your time trying to accumulate uh, loose connections that you don't have any uh, anything of substance with so one of the things that I, I share with my clients is this idea of a, of a yes, yes box. When you're looking at the people that you are connected to, is there's kind of two axes here. Uh, one question being, do you, do you know this person? Um, and either you know them, yes, or you don't know them. And then the other question is, do they know me? Uh, yes, they do, or no, they don't. And this this uh, quadrant here is, is the yes, yes box. These are the people who are most likely to buy from you, the most likely to refer to you. It's they know you and you know them. You'd recognize them in the grocery store. They show up at a networking event and you'll wave at them across the room because you know who they are. Um, these are the easiest people to have a conversation with. These are the people that'll take your call. These are the people that you can, um, have a deeper connection with and get to know better. Uh, these are often the people that are not scary to be in touch with. And yet, anytime I talk to people about marketing and growing their business, they immediately want to go into the no-no box, uh, which is how do I get in front of more strangers? Uh, they don't know me, I don't know them. And these are the this is the area where you have to work the hardest to actually have to build that kind of a relationship. Um, so over here, we've got um, people that know you, but you don't know them. Now, these are the people that you can reach through content marketing. A number of people talked about content marketing, sharing your expertise. Um, right now, if you're watching this video or if you're here uh, listening to me, it's kind of like you know who I am or you will know who I am by the end of, of this evening. You'll know quite a bit. I might not know a lot about you. And if you're watching from TV land, uh, watching the, the video. Hi, um, I've got no idea who you are. Uh, so this is, you know, this is how we think about growing our business. So what we're really wanting to do is move these people into that yes, yes box. How do we get them to connect with us? And then of course, we've got people that we know, but they don't know us. And these would be the kinds of people that you would follow and, you know, call them famous people. But this is, 
what you can do with this is really be mindful about the connections that you have, the people in your yes, yes box. Who are the people there that you really want to cultivate those relationships with? Take a look at the people that you know and that they know you and kind of like you can highlight them or pull them out and say, okay, these particular people would be really worth investing some time and energy in because they have the highest probability of really paying off. It would make sense to nurture that relationship. Um, then you're wanting to, you know, with kind of like attraction marketing, inviting people to connect with you is to kind of pull out the people in the in your fans list, the people who know of you and invite them to take a step closer and actually have a conversation with you, get to know you. Um, and then in the people that you follow, you follow or you can research, you can find them, you can go to LinkedIn, you can look for them is to once again, mindfully kind of pick out who is most, who's the you know, best kind of a contact that I might be able to nurture and put a plan into place to really nurture those people too, so that they get to know who you are and you move them into your yes, yes box. And ultimately what you're wanting is, to, is a nicely cultivated uh, group of people in your yes, yes box um, that can send you business. And it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a huge, 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 huge number. So that's my, uh, kind of take on the uh, big audience or small audience kind of a thing. But if you're into coaching and consulting, you're working with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, this makes a lot of sense. You don't need a, a, an enormous email list in order to get uh, a sufficient number of clients to stay in business. Um, another piece of advice that we hear so frequently, like this is the way to approach marketing is to have a target market and a niche and create an ideal client avatar. Um, <laughs> anyone heard, heard that before? This is the advice that we're given. And it's often, often we are told to look for like demographic information. How old are they? What gender are they? What occupation are they in? What is their uh, kind of how much money do they make? Uh, sometimes I want like really personal details about, you know, I had one client say that she was encouraged to do one of these, ask how long their fingernails are. Um, a lot of this stuff is just simply not relevant uh, to trying to determine who is the group of people that could potentially buy from you. Uh, and a lot of that that kind of demographic information isn't all that useful in helping you figure out um, who your next clients are going to be. And this is especially true if you offer professional services and especially, especially true if you do something that's transformational like coaching or consulting. Um, not all 30 year old women who live in Kitsilano think alike or, or are interested in the same things or, or actually have anything uh, really in common with each other. So um, a few years ago, I, um, one of the things I do is I have a tracking sheet uh, for my for my marketing. Um, I should have put a picture up. <laughs> anyway, it's a spreadsheet. And along the top of the spreadsheet are the months, January through December, and a column for how um, how they found me basically through the marketing. And then down the left hand side are their names because I work with my clients one-on-one, -on -one. they have names, <laughs> they are actual people. And what I do is I use this tracking sheet throughout the year. So I write down the names of the clients I work with and how much money they paid me in each one of each one of the months. So every time I add a client, the name goes in and the number goes into a column. And at the end of the year, I erase the sheet and start all over again. Well, about three years into my business, it was um, end of December, beginning of January, and I'm kind of closing out the one year and opening the next. So I'm creating a new spreadsheet. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my at my spreadsheet for the year. And it's like, oh, look at me. This is what I accomplished. These are the clients that I worked with. This is the money I made. Oh, look at my marketing. This is how I met them. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is what's working in terms of marketing. And I observed that list of names that at the beginning of the year, I didn't know who half of them were. I had never heard of them before. They were, you know, January of the previous year, these people were not in my world. They weren't in my yes, yes box. I had no idea who they were and yet they showed up. And I had gotten to that place in my business where I just kind of trusted that, 
you know, the business kind of chugs along and the clients come in. Yeah, I have to do stuff, but the clients come in and I trust that they'll be there. And as I erase that sheet for the new year, I'm like, wow, at the end of this year, there's going to be names on this blank sheet that I don't know. And it just kind of hit me. My future clients are already out there. Um, like these people exist. Um, and here's what I know about them. They exist. They're going to buy from me and they want to hear from me because how else could they become a future client? And it really shifted how I looked at my marketing. And it was no longer about, you know, how do I get out there and convince and convert and persuade or whatever? It was more about, okay, <laughs> they're out there. And when I looked at my past clients, I'm like, oh, what do I know about them? It's like, I know that they're nice people and that they're great and we have great conversations and we have a relationship. I really like them. Um, so when I started to think, okay, well, who are the people who are going to be on my spreadsheet? And it's like, how can I get efficient? How do I get, how do I find those people? Because those are my people and I just have to find them. Uh, so it kind of shifts how I approach uh, target markets and future clients, like, you know, who's going to buy from you is to look at it this way, is that the people are going to buy from you look a certain way. How do you, how do you get in front of the people who um, are going to come to you next, knowing that they already exist, they're already out there. So you know these things about them, you know three more things about your future clients. Um, you know that they have a problem that you can help them solve or they have something that they want that they don't have yet that you can help them get. This is an important element of whoever your future clients are um, because if this isn't true, uh, then they don't need you. So we know this for sure. So when you start thinking about identifying your ideal clients, this is, this is a must have, it's not optional. Um, they want to solve it in the way that you solve it. Um, we often make a mistake of looking at people and going, wow, they really need what I do. Uh, we can see their problem. We know we can fix it. We see that they need it, but they don't. Um, so people buy what they want, not what they need. Right? They'll convince themselves that they need what they want, um, but it comes from their perspective. Um, so they need to want to solve that problem and they need to want to solve it in the way that you offer. So if you, if you sell um, a self-paced digital course, they need to want a self-paced digital course. You're not going to sell it to them if what they're looking for is one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching support because that's not what they want. So they, you know, might be two different ways of solving the same problem, but they want it in the way that they want it. Um, and clearly, you know that because that's what you offer and that's what they bought in the future. Um, and the third thing is that they're ready, willing and able to pay your fee. Uh, we know this about our clients. They want what we have to sell and they're willing to pay us. Um, Patty, so are you open to a question? I am open to the question, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, question from Lisa? Yes. That's a long one. <clears throat> <laughs> I learned a song as a kid at a Girl Scout camp, then went, went like this. Make new friends, but keep me old. One is silver and the other one's gold. It is often hard to let go of old contacts and friends I've had for a long time. I'm wondering how to be better at not keeping holding on old contacts just because they've been contacts for a long time. Some are clearly long-term friends I'm still in contact with, Others are past friends, potential client contacts that I haven't been in touch with, but think maybe I can get back in touch with them someday. I think the kernel of the question is, how do you get rid of the old wood in order to make room for the new wood? Well, I would say that, um, well, first of all, there's a difference between life and business, right? Uh, this is not uh, <laughs> this is not the presentation where Patty says, "Oh, I should ditch all my old friends." Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, personal and business. I mean, and there's often a blend um, for us. Um, but uh, just in terms of of kind of the the business stuff, um, 
I think it's about, you know, where do you spend your time and where do you spend your energy? And I'd be like, okay, how can you spend the time cultivating the new relationships and kind of let the old ones kind of go away? They maybe get just um, a little bit less of your time and attention and put more time and attention onto the ones that you really want, um, that you really want to cultivate. Um, does that answer the question? Why don't we assume the answer is yes? Let's assume the answer is yes. <laughs> it's about where, you know, it's about where your time goes and where your energy goes. And sometimes it's, it's um, not providing a lot of, act, like setting up boundaries to not provide a lot of access to your, um, to your calendar. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'd love to talk to you and I'm kind of book solid. How about we connect in six weeks or something like that um, rather than you know making space immediately so sometimes it's it, it's about that it's just kind of um, shortening the, maybe the amount of time that you're spending there and not actively you know like that's if they're they're kind of um, coming into you uh, but in terms of actively outreaching uh, to people take them off your like, kind of active outreach list and for some of those people that know you but you haven't been in touch with for a while those are they're still in your yes yes box like you know they'll remember who you are and if you know, you can do a little bit of research on them. Take a look at what they're posting on social media or on LinkedIn or on their website and see if they look like they could be a potential fit. And if they are, that's a great, um, a great place to start in building relationships is to get back in touch with those those people. It's like we all have them. You go through your, your contact list. There would be people there that you already know, people in your yes, yes box um, that could be really good people to get back in touch with. So um, question, um, here's a question for you. This is a pop, this is a pop quiz. <laughs> Let's say, and I, I, we have a ringer in the room too. Let's say you're selling books. Your product is books. Who do you want to, to market to if, um, for books, do you want to get in front of the family that has like a whole room set aside as a library that buy books on a regular basis that have, uh, you know, family reading time and read a lot, um, way above average? Or do you want to try to reach the people who, uh, research I just did today, um, the 80% of Americans who have not read a book in the last year? Um, if you sell books, which group do you want to get um, in front of? That's a little bit like the shoe salesman who went to Africa 100 years ago. There were two of them. One reported that there's no market. No one buys, no one wears shoes here. And the other one said, what a fantastic potential. No one wears shoes here. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that's actually a really good um, kind of a description of something that I see quite a lot of is like, I, the, um, tell me in the chat, like, are you, if you're selling books, is it the untapped market of how do I um, convince and persuade the people who've never read a book that reading is awesome and I educate them on reading and spend a lot of time and energy trying to kind of convince them to read or are you just going after um, the people that already read? Do we have any kind of consensus in the chat? And uh, they, everybody says, go after the people who read a lot. Yeah. This is um, one of the biggest kind of indication um, that somebody is going to buy from you or that um, an attribute that you can have for your ideal client uh, profile or ideal client avatar is that they have bought um, what you're selling before, or they've bought something similar before. A lot of times people want to swoop into that untapped market of, wow, there's these people over here that never buy this thing that I'm selling. So I'm going to go in and try to um, swoop in and educate them and change their minds and uh, 
um, get them to buy this thing. And it's often like for my people, coaches and consultants is like kind of like they're putting on their superhero cape and they just want to swoop in and save the day. They see people that um, are having problems and challenges and they're struggling. Uh, the problem is that those people don't want help. They don't want to hire a coach. They're not interested in getting that kind of help. Um, so there's a lot of frustration that happens in that in that situation. But um, one of the, the, the best ways to figure out um, who's going to buy from you is based on have they bought either exactly what you sell or something similar to what you sell before. Um, so this comes down to like when we think about what we spend money on, it comes down to what what do they value? Um, and uh, for the life coaches in the room who do kind of core values exercises and things like this, it's a little bit like a shortcut um, is you could figure out what they value based on um, where they spend their money. You yourself can figure out what you really value, regardless of any core values exercise you've ever done. You can figure out what you value when you look at how you spend your money and how you spend your time. And this is true of your clients as well. Um, I often say that what people are doing when they're deciding to buy is they're weighing. It's like on the one hand, they got the stack of cash that they need to give up in order to, to work with you or to buy from you. And on the other hand, they get the value that they're getting from you. They need to value what they're getting from you more than they value the money in order to actually, um, to order to actually be a client. So, one a really good question that you can ask about your own business is what do people need to value in order to buy this product or service that I'm selling? What is it that what is it that they value? And to give you an example, I uh, worked with a client a few years ago that um, offered like really um, customized kind of nutrition, uh, supplement advice, what to eat, uh, very, um, a very detailed kind of analysis and recommendations of, of, of uh, what to do in terms of uh, nutrition and health. And, you know, what do people value? who buy that kind of a service is that they value health. It's like when you look at their core values, their number one value is going to be health. If you look at their credit card statements, you're going to see that they're shopping in health food stores, that they're in a gym, they, they're buying supplements, they're already spending money in that area because they value it. Um, and when they started looking for people who are like, okay, where do the people who value health go? What do they do? They were able to make some alliances with other businesses that sold um, health related services. And that was the breakthrough, uh, you know, lots of clients because it kind of tapped into, um, you know, a, a pond of people, a, a, a group of people that really valued that was interested in buying. Whereas before they were going to networking events for business people and it's kind of hit and miss as to whether or not the people there value health. Um, whereas going to a health food store, going to a gym, all of a sudden you're surrounded with people who, who hold that value. So the other question to ask is what do they purchase that is similar to what you offer? Um, so if you're selling one-to-one -one, um, coaching services, perhaps they have uh, uh, paid, paid for counseling before, or they've paid for some kind of adv advisory sort of service before. It's like, that's, it, it's, that's something that they're familiar with buying. They've bought it before. Um, and it might not be exactly the service that you offer, but they joke a lot about coaches buying from other coaches. And it's like, it's because they value it. And, you know, I was surprised the first time somebody hired me as a coach, even though they already had a coach. And now I am not surprised at all. I am, I am probably never somebody's first coach. <laughs> it's like, I'm not the first advisor that they've worked with because they value getting that one-to-one -one support. Uh, so they've already purchased something similar. So this is also a good question for you to ask in your business. It's like, um, what have they purchased that's similar to what I have? It's kind of like if you ever go to a workshop, uh, primary topic of conversation is what other workshops you've been to. It's, you know, people who buy training by training from a lot of people. Um, and what this kind of opens up is this idea 
um, counterintuitive as well about who is our competition. And when you consider that the people that are going to buy from you have bought something similar before from somebody from somebody else, often the people that we um, intuitively think our competitors are actually better collaborators. I, I remember I learned this from a from a woman named Barbara Sher, uh, the originator of the idea party for <laughs> um, who uh, went to a write speak retreat. And one of the things that she said is that uh, she was in the business at that point of teaching people to do what she does. And she says, you know, sometimes the people who come into the program would feel a little bit uncomfortable because they were basically offering very, very similar kind of work to what Barbara did. And they f came in feeling a little bit like they were competitors. And she said, I think it's awesome if you, if you do the kind of work I do. Like, first of all, the mission is big. Lots of people need this help. But she says also, she says, people bring me in to speak, but they can't have me every year. If they're going to do this conference every year, they might have me once every two years or three years or five years. Uh, but in those years when I'm not speaking, they often say, hey, Barbara, who do you know that does something similar to what you do? We're looking for a speaker. Uh, so there are opportunities um, for us to connect with people who look, uh, you know, kind of on the surface or on paper, like they might be competitors, but sometimes that's like the best way to bring people together. Um, this is a really good example. This, um, this fellow, Anthony, um, I don't know how to say his last name, Aaron Reno, <laughs> is a sales trainer. And he puts on this conference every year with his friends, his good friends, Mike Weinberg, Mark Hunter, and Je uh, Jeb Blunt. And I've read three of their sales training books. If you want to sell me books, um, I've read three of their books. They all, they all serve the same market. They all teach the same stuff, uh, but they promote each other's books. They put on this conference together because together in a team, they can fill a great big room like this full of people who buy sales training for organizations. They all offer the same product. Like it's very, very, I found it very, very difficult, difficult to kind of parse out what the differences were um, between what they were saying. They all seem to be on the same page, but they're, they're promotional partners for each other. Whenever anyone comes out with the book, the other one are out there, um, helping to promote the book. Um, and, and it just makes sense. Like even if those people would only ever have one sales training consultant work with their organization, they might decide based on personality, or, you know, or some kind of a nuance and approach that might make a difference for them. But it makes sense to team up with people who are technically um, competitors. Patty, are you open yes. to a slightly different question? A slightly different question, off the wall. Off the sure. wall. One of our audience members is a cat lover. Yes. And uh, she wants to know she, uh, to, to the degree to which she should feature her love of cats in her marketing. We had a similar, we had a speaker four weeks ago who was in love with uh, Golden Labs, Springer Spaniels, not sure. Uh, the next day, she actually found one, ha having been looking for several years. Uh, and she asked the audience, what's the degree to which I should feature my incoming puppy? And the audience said, do it. What, did, what are your thoughts to answer Lisa's questions about cats? Um. I learned a really, really interesting tidbit from um, from a um, a competitor of mine. <laughs> He's not really a competitor, uh, named uh, George Cow, and he taught a Facebook um, advertising and marketing class. And one of the things that he said is that when you use a lot of images in your ads or in your posts of, for example, cats. Um, he says the Facebook algorithm will actually optimize it to show it to people who are historically known to interact um, and like pictures of cats rather than people that are interested in what you actually do. So it's a little bit of a slippery slope in terms of 
of putting that forward. There's a very good chance that you're going to attract maybe lots of people that like cats, but are not quite so excited about what it is that you offer. Um, so on the one hand, maybe be careful with that kind of thing. But on the other, we connect with people that um, that we like. And if you have something in common, um, like I like people who like cats. <laughs> a lot of my clients like cats, like animals. Um, so showing a little bit of yourself and who you are can be a way to help build those relationships. Um, so I think it's really helpful to add it in. But a lot of times we're looking for a marketing angle that's going to sound kind of uh, cute or clever or catchy and stand out in some way that is not really related to what we do. And I would tread cautiously there um, that you don't want to be known as the cat lady <laughs> so much as you want to get known for the expertise and the help that you provide. Another question. This one is from Perry, who is a humor educator. Uh, yeah. How do I use... Um, uh, I'm a humor educator of many years and want to bring my inverted commas, how to use humor to improve your life and business and inverted commas trading to businesses. Who should I go after? The question to, to I'm, I'm going to actually get there in a moment. I'm going to, I'm going to put that question on hold for just a moment because I have a slide. No further questions. All right. Okay. I'm just paying attention to the time. <laughs> All right. This is the fly on the window. If you ever notice sometimes a fly can get caught, um, the window is closed and the fly will bat itself against the window over and over again and uh, trying to get out and totally ignore the wide open door that is right next to it. Um, I see a lot of people doing this. Sometimes we, where we think um, is, you know, the logical exit <laughs> or the way to solve the problem isn't necessarily where the problem is. So I'm going to show you three places um, where your marketing problems could be hiding uh, and may, might not be what you think that they are. So there's, in terms of marketing, marketing is a system. It's one thing after a next. Uh, I've broken it down into like three discrete stages that we that of what we need to do in our marketing. So the first thing is is this idea of get in front of people, get their attention, um, let them know that you exist. This is when we think about marketing. This is generally where we go. This is advertising. It's networking. It's social media. It's um, it's standing at the Sky Train station with a sandwich board with your uh, business on it. It's wherever you can get in front of people to let them know that you exist. The second stage is about educating, um, building know, like, and trust. Um, the know, like, and trust thing is really important for coaches and consultants if you're in a relationship business. Doesn't matter so much if you have the local gas station, although it could give you an edge. Um, but we need to let them know, let people know about our business, about our service, what we offer. Uh, this is providing the information. They're interested and they want to know more. And this is the middle stage. Um, the final stage for coaches and consultants and relationship businesses is kind of a sales conversation or whatever your sales process is. It might be a series of sales conversations. It might be that they buy from your website um, or, you know, mail order or whatever you do. But these are basically the three stages that you need to go through with your marketing. Um, this is what you do in order to put your stuff out in the world. There are two places is really where your potential clients can interact with you. The first one is somewhere in here. They hear about you and they're interested and they give you contact information of some sort. They sign up for your list. They follow you on social media, connect with you on LinkedIn. They let you know that they exist and that they are interested. Now you have a way of getting back in touch with them. And then if they're more interested, book onto your calendar in order to have a sales conversation. So those are kind of the two places where clients can interact. Um, you might recognize this if you if we kind of kind of flip it on its side uh, that this is commonly what people call a funnel. Um, and if you even if you look at you know some kind of a really complicated technical funnel, it kind of follows this flow. They may have a lot of moving parts in each one of these sections, but it basically follows this 
kind of a, a flow. And it does not have to be technical, um, especially if you're in a relationship business and you don't need to make thousands of sales. You don't need a fancy technical kind of a funnel. Um, in fact, we can do this. People used to do this before the technology uh, showed up. We used to be able to um, get in front of new people and have conversations with them without Facebook. Um, Right now, today, uh, we're all meeting different people because we're here at a networking event. This is, you did an introduction, you got your information in front of new people. Um, I'm here, you, you were in stage two of what I'm doing here. Uh, Meetup got your attention, got you here. Um, I'm providing some information. Uh, if I wow you enough, you might wanna have a conversation with me. This is a non-technical uh, way to approach a funnel. So you don't actually have to uh, do the technical stuff depending on your business. And what's really important here in terms of, you know, where is the real problem in your marketing? Heard a lot of people say need more leads, need more leads. A lot of people say that, that they need, um, you know, more people on their list. They need more of this contact information, contact information, contact information. Um, but maybe you need to do more work here. Maybe the problem isn't here, maybe it's here, or maybe it's here. Are those sales conversations going somewhere? Uh, are people buying or not? Can you get them to book onto your calendar? Uh, really good question to ask uh, before you decide to do the next thing for your marketing is like, where is the problem? What is the actual problem? And do I even know, am I tracking stuff? Do I have numbers to tell me uh, what that problem is and to figure out where is it so that um, I can actually look after it. And where a lot of people go with this is they go to the mechanics. They go to the mechanics of how do I set up the, uh, do I have the right kind of technology? Is my, is, do I have the right funnel system? Do I have the right email system? Do I have the right setup with my camera? Do I have things all connected? Um, technically do i have all the landing pages that i need do i have all of all of the emails are they in a sequence are they ready to go what are the mechanics how do i set up facebook ads do i have my pixel installed it's all very technical kind of questions that they ask um, it's kind of the kind of the go-to place and sometimes it's like fly in the window thing and the wide open door is that the problem is not with the mechanics but it's with the messaging. It is what you say um, on each one of those, um, one of those pieces of communication that you put out into the world. It's uh, do the do the words that you're using. Do they connect with your future clients? Do they get their attention? Do they actually build the know, like, and trust? Do they take them a step further along towards um, getting in touch with you and potentially buying? Uh, I'd say that most of the time, marketing problems come down to uh, not getting in front of the right people, uh, not getting the timing right on the system, trying to push people too far, trying to go from, um, hello, how are you, buy from me now, um, and not having, not communicating well enough um, so that people understand what you do and how it can help them. And this is the final um, kind of tip for uh, today, and it goes back to the question, Roger, that you just asked me. This is the biggest marketing misconception um, is that it is about you. And, and people will ask me, Patty, how do I stand out from everybody else? How do I explain what I do? I, how do I explain that I do these four different things and they all fit together? Um, how do I come up with a unique title for myself? How do I come up with a unique, catchy business name? Um, how do I let people know that I'm so much better than everybody else? It's very much centered on the person. Um, you know, it's all about it's all about me. How do I stand out? How do I attract people? How do I get this message about what I do out there? And this is the biggest secret with marketing is it's always about your client and what's going on in your head. So in terms of who are the best people to reach out to in terms of um, offering a specific kind of a service. It's the people who have a problem that you can solve as, you know, based in their words, what problem is your service solving and talk about that problem and look for people who are having that problem and talk to them about that problem. The, 
your marketing lands really, really well when, when you can get inside the head of your future clients and address what it is that they're looking for, to say it in language that they understand, um, to talk about what's going on for them, to have empathy for their problem, to propose um, helping them in some way, showing them that they can get a different result. It's always about the client. That's like the core of effective marketing uh, begins there. So I would really love it if you could type into the chat, like, what, what are you taking away from there? Did you get an aha moment? Um, what is it that you found valuable from tonight that you um, would be using? I would love to hear that. Um, and if you want to know more about me, I'm at uh, pattyk.com. I do offer a free consultation if you want to chat with me about messaging. And my partner and I uh, do a weekly cross between a um, an online class and a business talk show every Wednesday morning. Uh, and we also record it and put a whole bunch of content on YouTube. We basically give away everything that we know. And that's at ushapebusiness.com if you'd like to take a, uh, take a look at that or show up and uh, attend our show one day. And uh, that is it for me. I'll turn it back to you, Roger. Uh, Patty, you have, as usual, delivered with your normal style of soft, kind, gentle, but controversial ideas. Uh, you always bring fresh to your VBN presentations. And for that, on behalf of VBN and the audience here tonight, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to uh, uh, stop, the, um, stop the recording, but uh, uh, audience that's here in real time, uh, do not go away. Uh, an important message follows just for you. <laughs>